Hey Dave, what's up? What's going on, man? How are you doing? Hey, looking forward to talking about bar muscle ups today. Uh, of course, this is your thing, being a gymnat, being a gymnast. Um, but I've dabbled in CrossFit quite a quite a bit for the last ten years. And what I wanted to start off with is is this idea of I think some people can do ring muscle ups either easier than bar muscle ups, and that's the case for me. Bar muscle ups, I can I can do one pretty well but um, they kind of die really quickly and I start missing them a lot quicker just to the point to where I can't even get one anymore than I do even ring muscle-ups. Do you find that to be common or even something that is kind of individual dependent? So for me, the comparison, a good comparison is say sumo deadlifts versus conventional deadlifts in uh, kind of the weightlifting terms. Um, even though I'd never done any or any sumo deadlifts at all until a couple years ago, it didn't take me too long to be able to deadlift I think around 100 pounds more than I'd ever picked up from the ground with a conventional deadlift. So some athletes are just more suited for sumo deadlift versus conventional and vice versa. Do you think that's the same for ring versus bar muscle ups? Actually, I think this is a really good question. I get this question quite a bit. And I think it's a little bit more intricate than just being good at one or the other. I think there are, are pros and cons and pluses and minuses to what make people strong for uh, a ring muscle versus a bar muscle up. What you have to understand is that what most people will find easy about a ring muscle up is that there's no barrier in the way, right? When you're yeah. doing a bar muscle up, you have to get up and over that barrier of the bar to be able to complete the movement. The rings, you don't have that barrier. So you can actually finish the movement in a much lower position than you can on the bar muscle up. Mm -hmm. So essentially what that equates to is you can get away with a much weaker pull on a ring muscle up than you can on a mm -hmm. bar muscle up. You need a much stronger pull on the ring muscle on the bar muscle up to be able to get up and over to complete the push portion, which you don't have to worry about on the ring muscle up. Now this can be a good thing if your push is good. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is that you can get away with a really weak pull on rings and finish in a really low dip. So if mm -hmm. your push is good and you're in the bottom part of the dip and that's a comfortable position for you, pushing out into support is not gonna be too much of an issue, right? You can make that mm -hmm. rep because the bottom part of your dip and you and your push are sufficient to be able to make up for a lack of pull strength. Uh, on the bar side, you just pull right into that bar, you'll hit that barrier, and it'll be an issue for you. Now, what I will say is that sometimes people will think that the ring muscle up is easier because they can get on top, but they don't have the strength in the bottom part of that dip to be able to complete the rep, and there's a lot of issues that come along with that. And what I mean by, you know, falling through and not being able to press out and missing reps over and over again, maybe hitting one and then missing 10 and not understanding why. And it has to do with not having enough of that push strength or that strength in the bottom part of the dip to be able to complete it, even though they can finish slow. Maybe it's a mobility plus they have mm -hmm. the ability from a mobility standpoint to get to that bottom dip and not the strength to be able to get through it. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's interesting. And I've never really looked at it in that way. And I would say that's probably why. I am more comfortable with the ring muscle up is because I am comfortable. I do have the mobility in the bottom position of that dip and the strength to be able to uh, to push out of it or at least kip out of it a little bit more comfortably. Um, but I run a, run into a number of individuals that can do bar muscle ups, but they can't at all do uh, ring muscle ups. So that's very interesting. That's uh, the other side know. of the equation, though. Yeah. That, that's the part that we haven't mentioned yeah. yet. So the other part of the equation is there are a lot of people that can do bar muscle ups, but not the ring muscle up. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a huge proponent, and you'll hear me say this endlessly, of people starting on static apparatus. And I think people mm -hmm. are just jumping to rings way before they're ready for it and right. not spending enough time on static apparatus, meaning between parallel bars, on parallettes, and plank, getting comfortable in something static before you can apply it to yeah. something dynamic. But because of the way people are going into the gym and seeing, you know, 30 muscle ups in a workout and just jumping right into that, um, they're thinking that that's the route to be able to just do more reps or get onto rings more and you'll be able to figure it out as opposed to getting the strength and stability to really understand how to apply it to something dynamic. The dynamic action of the rings is a huge component and a missing link for most people to be able to actually do those ring muscle ups. So while you don't have the barrier in the same way that you do on a bar muscle up, because the rings are independent and you have to worry about stabilizing, that's the component that becomes an issue for most people on ring muscle ups. Do I have the ability to stabilize the rings through my shoulder, mm -hmm. through my upper body, to be able to control what happens once I actually get above the rings? Most people don't have it if they're just starting out. Mm -hmm. On bar muscle ups, you don't have to worry about the stability because the bar is fixed. 
So that's yeah. the plus side of the bar muscle up. Fixed apparatus versus dynamic, barrier versus being able to finish in a low position. Got it. Now I actually completely understand why we're starting with bar muscle ups and it makes so much sense because it's the same thing that I try to do with everything in weightlifting. And an example of, of that is you just said a static apparatus. While I'm always trying to talk people into using a static start position, which is mean, which means you get into your, your cleaner snatch start position, you um, find it, you lock into it, you hold it for one, two, maybe even three seconds, and then you slowly initiate from the floor. So same kind of thing. And, and, uh, I appreciate you making that more, more yeah. apparent to me for sure. And and that's going to help me as an athlete and a coach. I know now the easiest bar muscle up I've ever done. The easiest, I guess, variation is one that, that you taught me along with a number of other participants in a clinic that we did a number of years ago now here in Texas, I believe. Um, God, what, when was that? Eight years ago, seven, eight years yeah, ago. Yeah, my God, that was a while ago. And I think you, this variation you called um, a glide kip, uh, or more of a gymnastics swing. Um, could you explain the difference in that and a couple of the other ones that um, that are taught as well? Sure. So uh, I think what it's what's important for people to understand that the way that I teach and the way that I view bar muscle ups is that I think there are three different variations. And there's one that's on one side of the spectrum that's much more strength-based. It takes a lot of strength. That's much more of a vertical action, like you're using a lot of your pull strength to be able to get on top of the bar. Almost working from a strict bar muscle-up, but using a little bit of dynamic action along with it. Then at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have one that's much more swing-based, where you're trying to take advantage of the momentum, the dynamic action that goes along with the swing to do the strength for you. And that's kind of the one that you're mentioning right now. You're mentioning a glide kip, or what we call in the gymnastics world, maybe just a kip. And this, this is built off of a gymnastic swing. And a gymnastic swing is essentially a pendulum. It's where you have one fixed point where your hands are on the bar and your body is rocking back and forth. And what we're trying to look for here is three different positions. If you ever go to a gymnastics gym, you're going to hear a coach talk about these three positions. You're going to talk about the hollow position in the back part of the swing, which is essentially the setup. Then as they come through the bottom, you'll create the arch position which is the kind of uh, creation of your power. The bigger that arch and the more uniform that arch, the more power you can generate. And then in the front part of the swing, you have your kick or your scoop, the end of the position. So it's basically starting in that hollow, arching through the bottom, creating power, and then utilizing that power at the front part of that, that hollow in the front and that kick. So you have hollow arch kick. It's one of the things I'm endlessly telling uh, people wanting to learn this swing. Hollow arch kick. It's how you generate power through the entire body. Now, the gymnastics kip, what it does, it allows that swing and the toes to come up. They come all the way up to the bar. Essentially, what you're looking for is actually a contact point. You want your ankles to be touching the bar. And then what I equate this to when I'm teaching people is essentially the same as bar path that you would teach with the Olympic barbell in hand. You want to keep the bar close to the body. So actually, the cue that we use when we're teaching this skill to kids in the gymnastics world is to pull your pants up. Mm -hmm. So essentially, once your hands are touching your ankles, essentially it's like pulling your pants up. So it's basically trying to teach kids a cue, a way for them to visualize right. bar path. Keep the bar mm -hmm. close to the body to keep everything nice and intact. Mm -hmm. So that bar muscle up, that one is a much more, the intention should be much more of a straight arm pull, much, much more of a lat activated pull rather than a pull from the extremity. But it's relying on a much more dynamic action with the feet coming above the bar with the ankles actually in contact with the bar. Much more swing-based as opposed to the one that's more vertical, which is much more strength-based. We can go into this a little bit more, but we want to see if that kind of makes sense to you. Yeah, so um, for the way I understand it is is you hollow arch, and then when you're hollowing again, as you're swinging, you then um, fold the hips to try to bring your ankles close to the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, once the once the ankles get close, um, uh, or even touch, I guess, yep. at that point, that's when you uh, initiate turn the pull. Over. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. Okay. And actually, that position that you're talking about, where the ankles are actually at the bar, where you're folding at the hips, that pike position, we call that a basket position. So mm -hmm. in the gymnastics world, that yeah. actually call is called a basket, where your hands are on the bar and your ankles are essentially in that same toes to bar type of a position, where you've completed the toes to bar. Uh, that's called a basket position in the gymnastics world. And that basket position is actually important for a lot of different skills, but it's kind of how we learn it uh, through that kip. 
Yeah, and, and all those years ago, I remember the first time that I hit that right. I mean, it was it felt like magic. I just magically magically landed on top of the bar, so it was really cool. And I think you told a story even about a CrossFit competition that you went to, and you asked them what the standards and the rules were because in CrossFit we all know that uh, like in a, a ring muscle up and even a bar muscle up, they don't want the toes to go to a certain height. I think that's what. Yeah, I you're not allowed to go above like the bar with the ankles. I, th I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you were saying that you asked what the standards were and they didn't have any. So you just kind of went back and forth between <laughs> those two positions. Yeah, that was like uh, back in the day. I, I never really entered any uh, competition myself, but these were we were just promoing uh, the ring thing. We were there for a Power Monkey, uh, you know, exhibit. And uh, they were doing these little mini wads throughout the day. Like you could win $100 if you could do the most burpees in a minute or most toes of bar in a minute. And one of them was most bar muscle slips in a minute. So I had asked them like, what are the standards for this move? And they're like, shoulders below the bar, shoulders above the bar. And I was like, are you sure that's it? That's all you're asking mm -hmm. for here? And they said, yep, that's it. So all I did was a drop kip, which is a variation where uh, you ankles to the bar and then you pull on top of the bar and then just stay in the basket position the whole time. So essentially mm -hmm. you just right. never let your feet leave the, the that basket mm -hmm. position, your ankles close to the bar. And I just did as many as I could in the minute. I didn't really, I got down, I took my $100, I left, and they told me never to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I wish I could even do that. But, um, you know, talking about the bar muscle up that I think most CrossFitters, most uh, people in the fitness world are familiar with, uh, these days, I think for me, you know, when I'm, I'm, I think I get a little bit of confusion between the bar muscle up and the ring muscle up again, because I am a little bit better at the ring muscle up. I think my body kind of tries to go to that. And I think I end up, um, pulling too early with my arms and, uh, trying to stay maybe too close to the bar. Um, when I allow that swing to develop longer, um, and I'm able to swing a little bit more further around the bar, that's when the bar muscle up is, is actually very easy for me. It's just hard for me to, to maintain that. Do you find that's common as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this comes back to a patience issue, right? And something that, you know, I notice a lot when I have a barbell in hand and I'm trying to clean or I'm trying to jerk and, or, uh, to snatch off the ground, I'll end up pulling right off the ground because it's a patience issue, you know? It's yeah. a new movement for you. You're thinking about the completion of the movement rather than the steps that lead up to the completion and you get ahead of yourself. Now, <clears throat> before we kind of dive a little bit deeper into that, I just want to make sure I clarify uh, the other two variations of the bar muscle yeah. because I think we touched on it, but I want to make sure that people understand exactly um, the first two that we, we kind of glossed over. The first being, like I said, more strength-based, which is building from someone doing a kipping pull-up into a kipping chest-to-bar, and essentially just thinking of it as a building block, where a uh, chest-to-bar, excuse me, a, a, a kipping pull-up and a kipping chest-to-bar, and then a bar muscle-up, I look at them as all the same movement along one single continuum. And if you can get a good chin over bar uh, with a kipping pull up and your chest mm. to the bar with your body nice and vertical, eye line staying forward the whole time, thinking about creating a nice vertical pattern. Then over time, as your pull gets stronger, you will get mm. to a point where your pull is so high that now your center of mass is above the bar. And once mm. you've reached the point where your pull is sufficient to get your center of mass above the bar, it goes from a pull to a push and you've basically completed the bar muscle up. Yeah. So that bar muscle up is much more reliant on a strong pull. It's mm -hmm. much more reliant on strength than it is the gymnastic swing, which is much more reliant on the dynamic action of the swing. So that one is something that we would normally teach first because it falls in line with the way people are doing kipping pull-ups and chest to bar. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an action that they would normally be accustomed to doing. Plus, mm -hmm. it is more in line with the standard that they would be uh, mm -hmm. able to apply in, in uh, an actual workout. Now, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be teaching people the gymnastic swing. I absolutely continue to teach people the gymnastic swing. The swing by itself, maybe not its application to a bar muscle, but just the swing. Because I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of value in understanding the difference between kind of the CrossFit kip where you're two fixed point feet and hands and you're just rocking back and forth and in hollow and arch between those two positions versus that gymnastic swing that hits the hollow arch and the kick. They're mm -hmm. very different. The applications are different, but I think it's important for people to understand both. And then the third variation, which is what most people are doing in a competitive setting, is what I call a hybrid version. Mm -hmm. The hybrid version takes advantage of the benefits of both. It's a little bit swing, 
a little bit strength. It maximizes the potential of the swing, but keeps it with an allowable standard for a competitive setting. And in my mind, this is the one that you'll see most athletes do at the highest level that allows them to conserve energy and keep the high volume up. Yeah, so that last one that you just talked about, would you say that the one I was uh, describing is that hybrid variation uh, versus the chest-to-bar variation? The, the one you were describing? Yeah. I'd say it's probably more of the hybrid. Okay. Yeah. And would would you say that that's more comparable also, um, that hybrid variation to the way that people do ring muscle-ups, tipping ring muscle-ups? Well, I, I would say that the gymnastic swing – the gymnastic swing version, our version uh, that we talked about first, is the mm-hmm. way that you would normally see most people do a ring muscle up okay. because that takes advantage of the same type of a swing that you would be doing with the gymnastic swing. You can't do that CrossFit kip, that back and forth, right. on something dynamic. You can't do it right. on rings. You can only do that gymnastic swing. So the ring muscle up falls more in line with the gymnastics kip. Yeah, for sure. And the first one that you talked about, you know, kind of building off of the, the chin above bar and the chest above bar. Um, I don't think I've ever been able to do that. I've tried bar muscle ups uh, that way, but I know you've always told me to, when I'm doing strict pull ups or, or tipping pull ups to pull as high as you can, meaning get Peak um, pull. the, the, yeah, the, the bar as low on my chest as possible. And I always still to this day try to do that. It just dies off uh, really, really quickly. And I'm, I'm, I still don't have a strong enough pull to do a, well, you know a, where your homework chest. is, right? Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, but to do a bar muscle up uh, with that first variation that you talked about. But, you know, getting into this a little bit more, what are, say, three uh, tips that you would give people to develop their bar muscle ups or to overcome uh, some of the most common issues that you see? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple issues that we see common within the, the, the bar muscle up world. Um, one is just a strength issue, like you were talking about. You know, people don't work on their peak pull. And I mentioned peak pull because most people will work on their pull ups, even if they implement a lot of strict work on a regular basis. What they do is they only work on their strict pull as it pertains to a standard, meaning I'm only going to work on my strict pull up with chin over the bar. Right. So they become really strong at chin over the bar pull-ups, but they don't work very much on chest to bar, sternum the bar, belly button to bar, pulling higher, meaning peak pull. If you're going to be spending time on strict pull work, your intention should always be to be pulling as high as you possibly can. So that over time, your peak is not just chin over the bar anymore as it's applied to a standard, thinking more about getting as high as you possibly can with that pull so that it can be applied to strict bar muscle up, bar muscle ups, you know, with, with kip, whatever it might be, your pull is now sufficient to be able to apply it to a lot of different variations. So lack of strength is generally one of the biggest issues and making sure that they're working on the strength correctly. Peak pull is such a critical factor there. So that's number one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and another thing that you that I've learned from you and, and I've applied not, not enough, but a little bit, uh, there was a phase where I was trying to get my pull stronger, trying to get my pull up stronger, just a a random phase of my fitness uh, journey that, that I was trying to work on it. Um, and you mentioned that I should do more uh, rope climbs. So would you say that that would be a good recommendation for someone that knows that they need to need more strength for the bar muscle ups is to do say one or two or even three short workouts of rope climbs per week for a while? I love rope climbs. I love rope climbs. I mean, if you go to any gymnastics gym, you're going to see gymnasts doing rope climbs. It's great for grip strength. It's great for pulling strength. Um, it's one of those things that I think has a, a ton of transferability, um, to a lot of different movements. I think it can help the bar muscle quite a bit. Um, so, I mean, I, I, from a gymnastics background, I might be biased because we apply a rope climb so much to our training, but I do think that they're a missing tool for a lot of people. They, they, again, apply rope climbs to a standard figuring out leg locks and, and ways mm-hmm. to climb so they can apply it in a workout. But Uh, When I'm talking about rope climbs, I'm talking about working to legless rope climbs so they can work on really building that pull strength. Yeah, for sure. And what about um, uh, how much would you recommend applying tempos, even uh, holding over the bar for a certain amount of time as high as you can and then uh, slow descent? Yeah, I think this, uh, again, falls in line with uh, the way that you'd probably teach people some positions on an Oli lift. Mm -hmm. Um, we adhere to you know our gymnastics hierarchy, which we believe in greatly uh, with Power Monkey, and um, you know that phase one is our creation of body shapes, and phase two is where you build strength. It has to do with static holds and controlled movement. 
And this is exactly exactly where you build in your tempo work, where you build in your isometrics. And I think most people are just missing out or skipping out on this step so much that they never really understand the value of slowing things down. So one of one of my absolute cues uh, and and uh, guides when it comes to building strength is exactly that: slow things down. You need to be building uh, strength at your peak pull, so not just pulling to your peak point, but also holding, spending some time there, being uh, you know getting some time under tension in that peak pull, and then guiding yourself back back down through that eccentric back to your hang. So. I think that's one of the the most critical pieces of building strength for for your pole. And um, again, it's one of the things that I've learned from you as well on the uh, Olympic weightlifting side that Mm -hmm. you guys value so much in terms of building positional uh, components, whether it be for overhead position or a squat or whatever it might be, uh, the application of things like tempo and pause work. Oh, man, we we talk about slow down all the time, don't we? In fact, I would say for me personally as a teacher and a coach, and, and I would say even just in general at Power Monkey Camp, probably the most common cue by and far or most common concept is slow down, you know, slow down to, to learn the movement, slow down to strengthen the movement, pause in key positions and, and that kind of thing. So if someone came to you and they know that they're lacking the strength portion um, of a bar muscle up and you know that as well, and they're saying, look, I'm going to, I'm serious enough about this. I'm going to dedicate some time um, to making a change here, to really developing it and, and getting it to be uh, what I want it to be, what I think it can be, what would your recommendation be? You know, for example, for me, it's if someone comes to me with a specific um, fault that they have in their lift, I'm going to say, uh, I want you to do this drill, say three to four days a week for four weeks, make that commitment, you know, do it at that frequency um, for this number of sets and reps, and then let's reassess and go from there. Do you yeah, have something that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say that it falls very similar to what you're mentioning. Um, the consistency is the most critical part when it comes to application of these um, these cues. You know, we can give people all the cue, cues, drills, perfect, uh, you know, methods and tools to be able to work on these things. And unless they actually are doing them on a regular basis, they're worthless. So, in, in my mind, when you're starting out, I think three to four days a week is is um, exactly where you want people to be. Because I want people to um, be able to have a rest day in between so that they can really uh, allow the body to rest and maximize uh, the time that they actually are doing those uh, strict movements. And so I would recommend um, you know starting out exactly like you said, four to five weeks, sometimes we're on five-week cycles as well. Uh, but four to five weeks of doing three to four days worth of pulling uh, with a day or two in between each of those so that you can actually uh, feel a little bit of building process with generally the fourth week, a little bit of a a deload week, and then building back up for that fifth week. Uh, But I I do think that normally I would recommend, um, you know, three to four exercises specifically geared towards your pull uh, within each of those sessions uh, and they can have different variations. They can have different looks and feels. It doesn't always have to be the same thing. Um, but I think the consistency is one of the most, uh, the biggest missing pieces for a lot of people in terms of uh, seeing gains over um, long periods of time. They they do it for a short period of time and not working mm-hmm. for them, and they just end up stopping. Uh, absolutely, we need. You know, we all want something quick. We all have access to so many quick things in our lives. Just order something from Amazon and the next day or two days later you get it. And that's just not the case for these um, complex movements that we're, that we're talking about. I think any expertise here. though, you know, and we, we've yeah. talked about this a little bit and some other podcasts and I, I just, I think about this a lot and it, I don't think it can be stressed enough. The idea of any, anyone that is a master at what they do, anyone who has devoted their life to become a very high level professional, whether it be an athlete, you know, someone in the in the professional world, there is no quick route to that level of expertise that you want to achieve. Um, you know, you mentioned Amazon, and sure, I like to get my packages same day, and mm. but to build Amazon takes mm. yeah. decades, decades. Yeah. You think Bezos made Amazon in, you know, an afternoon or in, in a mm-hmm. delivery? Those things don't happen. Like you need to understand that if you're building a foundation for longevity and uh, trying to build a movement for longevity, you have to set your mind around the timelines that go along with it. I always, I always like to kind. Of, I start my seminars with a little 
gymnastics background. And I always like to mm-hmm. tell people some higher level gymnastics understanding. And I think this is a good one for, for people to understand. In the gymnastics world, we have our code of points, you know, our rules and regulations that kind of rate our skills. And um, I try to tell people this for perspective and not to demoralize them. But mm-hmm. our skills are rated from A level skills, which are most basic, all the way up to now I level skills, which is the most challenging, most advanced level skill there is. And there's only one I level skill. Uh, but all of our skills are kind of categorized uh, by those letters. And in the gymnastics world, a kipping muscle up, if done with straight arms, is a value of an A. So a kipping muscle up is an A. Uh, A strict muscle up has no value. It's not even an A. So that's already, you know, part that Mm. pisses people off. Like, wow, that has no value. Yeah. But the one that actually is most surprising to people is that an iron cross, an iron cross. So holding yourself out on rings Mm. with your arms out horizontally, your body vertically, that really famous movement that you see kind of everywhere, that iconic gymnastics movement, from A to I, that Mm -hmm. movement is valued at a B. Wow. A B-level movement. So that is one of our most basic level movements. Now, I have to say that an iron cross is probably the most difficult B that there is in our code of points. It's extremely challenging. It took me 12 years from the point that I started the sport to finally getting it my sophomore year in college to actually get it to the point where I could compete it. So these movements that we talk about, they don't happen in days and weeks, even months. Sometimes it's years and even decades to be able to get what we consider to be basic level movements. It's so critical for people to understand the timelines that go into learning these skills. You know, I just don't want people to think, you know, it's somewhat of an easy skill or something that they're seeing other athletes do and and think that they can just pick it up in, in a couple of days and and if they don't, they get frustrated as to why they can't, un- can't understand and someone next to them can get it in a turn or two. It's a lot more that goes into it than just, um, you know, jumping up there and, and just trying to figure it out like that. For sure. I think it's critical for athletes to understand that for sure. And, you know, to, to kind of go along with that, that's why I really like your five week recommendation. And for myself, I even like four weeks and sometimes three weeks to commit to just a couple things, you know, a couple things. Uh, even though we're only working on a couple of things, I'm going to have you do it frequently, like you said, three or four days a week, um, because those seem to be time frames that people can wrap their mind around a little bit more than than the years that it might really take them to to get a good full range of motion squat or to get a, a beautiful looking uh, clean and jerk or a, a beautiful bar muscle up and the ability to, to run those together. So, of course... Uh, you're saying that strength is probably the, the main issue and where people need to really think about starting. What are some of the other roadblocks that, that uh, athletes run into and, and need to think about beyond that? Yeah, after that strength issue, I think um, issue number two is an early pull, being impatient. We touched, talk, touched on this a little bit. And in my mind, this comes down to a very critical part of your swing. And I don't think it gets talked about enough. It's the front part of the swing, basically when you're in the arch. And it's what allows you to, basically, I look at the arch as a slingshot. If you can do a good slingshot, it will launch you into the next portion of the skill, into the actual pull portion. Now, most people don't spend enough time in creating a good arch, and it affects their ability Mm -hmm. to do the pull portion. So if you don't have a good arch, it's going to force you into an early pull. So the arch position is actually the main culprit in an early pull, a poor arch action. And the early pull is generally a symptom of the, the, okay. the bad arch. So the arch position that I'm looking for, I call it a reset arch. So when you're coming down from your swing and you're coming forward, the initiation of the arch is so critical in terms of what needs to initiate it. The initiation of that position needs to come from the torso and from the chest. Mm-hmm. Most people will think about leading from the torso and the chest, and a few things will happen. One, either they'll reach a point where mobility becomes an issue, and they hit basically a wall, and they'll start to bend their elbows. If they're bending your elbows in a swing, that's when a lot of breakdown happens in those joints. Your shoulders, elbows, lower back start to take a brunt of that position. I never want to see people swing in an arch position with bent elbows. It's really, really detrimental in the long run. just basically tells me that you're swinging within a range that's bigger than you can handle. And it's going to affect a lot of what's happening on the backside. What it also does, it starts to lead 
your knees and hips coming forward as opposed to making sure that the torso mm -hmm. and the chest are what lead the position, which means that after a few reps, your pull will start to be more and more horizontal. And by okay. rep two and rep three, your body's almost completely in like a front lever position. And this happens to a lot of athletes okay. who are like, I can't understand. You know, maybe I can get one rep in place and then on rep two and three, my body's completely horizontal and I'm pulling right into the bar. And it's because they haven't reset the arch through the upper back and through the shoulders. They've reset it more through the knees and the hips. Mm -hmm. And this ends up turning you over more. So that leads to, all right, I need to start pulling earlier because my arch isn't in a good position. So th that's one of the biggest issues that I see. And I think people need to spend more time on just the swing by itself and just that kind of back and forth action to understand how to create good positions and then apply it to their pull. Yeah, for sure. And, and I need to... Um take some of your medicine and my own medicine because I have people do swings all the time or not all the time, but at least a couple of days a week, even just in warm ups. even if we're not doing pull-ups or bar muscle-ups, I'll say, Hey, you know, we're doing three rounds of, uh, this warm up, And one of those exercises is 10 or 15 or 20, uh, kip yeah. swings and really, you know, having them focus on keeping the feet together and legs straight and arms straight, uh, and all that stuff that I've heard you say, uh, mm -hmm. million, millions of times, but you know what you just explained there, one is exactly what happens to me, you know, and those second and third reps for sure. That's exactly what's going on there. And it's frustrating to me because I am so technical in the Olympic lifts and I teach the Olympic lifts in that way. And I am patient in the Olympic lifts and I'm very thoughtful and focused in the right way and, and on the right things. And I have such a hard time doing it. Uh, but as you mentioned, it's because it's a newer movement for me. Yeah. And I just haven't put in the time. Um, I haven't gotten into the repetitions. If, if I really want to make a change, um, and learn that, then I need to be doing bar muscle up work um, three three times a week, just like we we recommended. Um, but it also sounds very much like a snatch or a clean. If you don't create a good position above the knee, which is comparable to me to the arch position, if your right. knees are too far forward, if your knees are too far back, if your elbows are already bent in that above knee position, that, in that transition position in the pull, then the rest of it is, is going to be off. You're going to compensate in a number of different ways. So it's so important that you get that down and that you get down the parts of that lift that are happening even before that transition position. Would you call the swing or the arch position a transition position for yeah, the muscle up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 100%. And I think, I think you're equating it uh, to that same knee position uh, really well. And I do think, like you said, if that position's off, then you're going to see a myriad of of problems that come along with the next portion of the movement. And that's what we see, whether that's pulling into the bar, or chicken winging because your your pull is early and you're still trying to get the weight over the bar, so you see one shoulder getting thrown over. And you end up seeing a lot of these different issues because that arch um, has not been set correctly. So your, your assignment there uh, then, Dave, is just to, with frequency, kind of practice that swing. Um, maybe, would it be fair to say, I need you to do... 10 swings to every one muscle up uh, that you try. Something yeah, like I, that. I think that's fair. I think normally I'd have people do between seven and 10 swings um, back and forth, uh, working on a very compact swing at first. Again, uh, the bending of those elbows will dictate the range that you'll stay within. Mm -hmm. so if you're bending your elbows, you're going to back off a little bit and only stay within a range where you can keep the positions uniform. I always tell people that curved shapes and straight lines when you're doing a swinging action are your friend and, and angles are your enemy. So if yeah. you're bending your elbows or bending at the hips, those things are going to create slack. And slack is when you really start to get that pull on your joints. So we want nice, uniform, long positions. And just thinking about just trying to build rhythm and trying to build the understanding of what's initiating, again, through the shoulders and through the upper back rather than the knees and the hips. Yeah, and, and what about, you know, probably the most common thing that I see in a swing, yes, I see the elbows bend for a lot of people, but even more often than that, I see a big knee bend, and not only a knee bend, but a big separation between the feet uh, and the knees. And, and to me, that just seems like it's making the body uh, heavier, uh, making making the muscle up as a whole uh, and the swing as a whole uh, a lot harder. Can you explain kind of the difference in what's going on there when someone's able to keep their feet and their knees together and their legs straight versus that um, leg spread apart, knee bent position? Sure. And, and I think this comes down to a, a very important piece. You know, you'll hear gymnasts or, you know, myself and other people who come from gymnastics background talk about, you know, legs tight and feet together and point your toes. 
And all those things have a purpose. I'm not just telling yeah. you that for aesthetic reasons and just saying for because points, I think it right? looks it's, nice. It's, it's yeah, not just for points. Because yeah. I'm judging you, right? No. <laughs> it has very little to do with that. It has to do with connection. It has to make sure that your body from your hands all the way down to your toes are working and reacting as one uh, uniform piece. And so if your legs are all over the place and not involved in the movement, they become dead weight. And that's exactly what you said. It becomes heavier. Mm-hmm. Your legs are no longer assisting with the movement. So they're just there. You're actually just like... Uh, like having a weight vest around your, your lower half right. and you're trying to pull that weight vest above the bar. You want your legs to assist in the movement. So the more you can stay connected, the more you can create a longer lever, especially when you're doing some of that kipping action, that longer lever can create more torque. It can create more energy that you can use on the backside once you initiate the pull. So that longer lever, especially when you have the feet and heels together, can actually assist you if you know how to use it properly. So I'm just not a big fan of under, and trying to do everything from the upper half and neglecting the lower half. It creates a separation between the two halves. Upper half is keyed in on lower half is doing nothing, neglected, and it becomes dead weight. Yeah, it's it, it uh, when you described that it, it reminded me of when I was uh, young. Uh, I was in elementary, I think, when I started doing this. I would wear leg weights even to school, like under under my jeans. You know, it's because I wanted to be fast. Um, but that's absolutely what it feels like whenever my legs start separating uh, in a swing, whether it's a, a pull up or a muscle up. It absolutely feels like I have literally have weights uh, on my legs. So, you, I mean, I can tell a big difference when I force my, my legs to stay straight and my feet to stay together. But when I'm coaching and when I do have athletes do this, and I say this for a lot of things that I teach in weightlifting too, I'm like, look, if you're not going to kip, practice your kip with your feet together, with your legs straight. Uh, and do it right, then you might as well not do it at all mm-hmm. because you're just reinforcing that that action that we that we can undo. If you're doing 100 reps like that and you only ever do one right, well, that one right is not going to really mean anything. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. You're reinforcing poor positions. That becomes your, your go-to. And then when you have to apply it, especially when you're under fatigue, what you mm-hmm. want to have happen is that when you fatigue, you revert back to good technique, right? right? And I think you would do the same thing. That's what I'm... You know, especially if I'm in a workout where I'm feeling like, you know, I can barely breathe, picking myself off the ground, and I have another 10 reps to go, I close my eyes and I'll say, okay, allow technique to get me through this. And I'll revert yep. back to trying to make technique as perfect as possible to be able to conserve energy. Yep. What most people will do if they don't have that technique to revert to is they'll just throw themselves through it. And yep. it actually creates more of a problem than if they had a little bit of the technique in place. So. I like to always go back to technique, especially as I become more more fatigued. And um, so I, I think it's it's so critical to make sure that you're taking reps and reinforcing good things and good patterns. Absolutely. So what is, uh, is there any other things that you see on a regular basis um, that, that you would address? Yeah, one more. One more I think is an important one because I think it gets glossed over too. It's what happens once you actually get above the bar and it has to do with wrist turnover. Um, we see this quite often with people who are good with their, their arch position. They're good with their strength. They have a, the timing of their pull is good, but what ends up happening is their wrist gets stuck and they end up not being able to be in a good push position to be able to complete the movement. And this has to do with one grip and forearm strength and bar manipulation and being able to understand how to get the bar to work for you once you actually are in a position to push down. And that's to do kind of where the bar sits in your hand and rotating that bar within your hand as you're going through the movement. And it's a little intricate. It's, it's, for, from my perspective, I think it comes naturally to me because I've done so many, but I've been breaking it down little by little uh, over the course of the past year or so. And it is a little bit more complicated than some people um, really understand. And I think it's one of those areas that um, we can definitely focus on a little bit more and give people some more help with. Yeah, so when you when you say wrist turnover, when someone's on top of the the bar there when they're finishing it, what what exactly do you want the wrist to be doing? Is it um, is it straight? Is it is it extended? So um, if you can maybe see in the screen here, this is what happens with most people above the bar. Mm-hmm. This this okay. uh, wrist position. If the bar sitting in the palm of my hand, the wrist will be here. It's a very weak position to be pushing from. When they're hanging, they'll be in a more neutral position, more that straight mm-hmm. line. But right. what we're looking for as we come over the top is a turning over of the wrist okay. so that the bar continues to be in a position where we can push down from. And what I'm looking for is, let's see here, uh, I want the bar to be sitting right in the crease of that wrist between, or uh, crease of that palm between my index finger and my thumb. 
So if it's in that position, I know I can push down on it as opposed to the bar being back here yep. and just being on my fingertips. That's a very weak position for my hands to be on the bar. So as we come over the bar, we're thinking about turning in the same mm. manner that our shoulder is coming over the bar. So the shoulder's rolling over and my wrist is turning over at the same time. It's not my shoulder and then my wrist stays flat. That's going to be a really okay. weak position to push from. So my shoulder and my hand are going to be rotating in the same same amount. Yeah, it makes, makes perfect sense. And it sounds like if you're, uh, I would say that being a wrist back position is what I kind of call it in, in weightlifting, mm -hmm. um, it seems like that's leaving your body behind the bar a little bit. Uh, so if you have a straighter wrist, your body's going to automatically be over the top of the bar a little bit more. Yeah, it, it will yeah. help facilitate your ability to pull the bar into your body and keep it close to your body. Because you can actually, again, I, I said bar manipulation. You want to control what's happening with the bar in your hand. I think most people yeah. just don't do this. So one of the ways to do it is get more comfortable with the bar in your hand. Hang yeah. more. More mm -hmm. hanging drills. So this is an area that has tons of value in a lot of different areas that we don't need to get into today. But if you're hanging from the bar in a lot of different grips, both over grip, under grip, mixed grip, single hand, different variations, it goes a long way in you being able to manipulate what happens with that bar once you need to apply it to a skill. So one of my you know, big goals with people that have issues with uh, wrist turnover is to do, yes, more wrist manipulation and getting the wrist and forearm mm -hmm. stronger, but just hanging from the bar goes so, just goes such a long way in being able to actually understand what's happening when that bar is in, actually, in your hand. Uh, well, hey, we, we've got a, a lot of really good capacity wad workouts to yeah, uh, absolutely. work on uh, grip strength and bar hanging and stuff like absolutely. that. So you guys can definitely... Uh, definitely check the check those out those short five minute workouts that can go a long way for you miserably um, useful that's for sure for sure well and you know hearing you describe that dave absolutely that's one of my problems as well and i'll tell you why i think it's one of my problems one because a lot of the action leading up to that is off so it's making it harder but i'm so used to holding a bar overhead a barbell overhead with my wrist back so with right. my wrist extended and to me that is the strongest more optimal way to hold the bar. So, you know, for me, and I think that's just probably the same for a lot of athletes too, because uh, most athletes that we're talking about in the fitness community are doing a lot of barbell work as well. And whether they realize it or not, with their heavy weights, they're holding the bar that way um, because your wrists aren't going to be strong enough to maintain that straight position once you reach a certain weight. And you wouldn't want to. It's going to be harder on the wrist. It's not as supportive of a position to hold a barbell with. So when you're getting used to that, you're getting used to turning over a snatch, for example, or punching through a jerk all the time with that wrist is back. I can see where that would cause some confusion with the body in getting to this uh, straight position. And so in that instance, that is a pretty big difference between weightlifting and gymnastics. And I think that we just have to spend some time in learning to differentiate between the two, the two bar actions, one being a barbell holding a bar overhead and the other being the way that we need to perform gymnastics optimally. And even, you know, um, hanging from a bar, like you said, I mean, that's the complete opposite way that I want someone to hold a barbell overhead. So um, it, it's interesting that a lot of athletes do try to hold the bar with a straight wrist overhead. Um, uh, it, it, you know, the opposite ways yep. that, that, that we that we do things, you know? Yeah, I think you're, you're bringing up a really good point. What I would say to that is, I think this is an area where maybe gymnasts have an advantage with bar in hand is because we do things in every plane, right? We don't do mm -hmm. things in just uh, standing on our feet. Uh, we do things inverted as well. So when we're talking about this in terms of hand position being on top of the apparatus, that mimics that, you know, being in support. But what we also do is we'll be on a bar inverted as well. So yeah. we become really accustomed to that same position that you're right. talking about with overhead position with a bar in hand, with a handstand, being flat on pommel horse, whatever it might be, because we do ranges of motion with our wrists that go to all extremes, both you know flexion yeah. and extension, we are becoming really comfortable in all of those ranges. So from a gymnastics perspective, with a bar overhead, for me, that was actually one of the most comfortable things for right. me when I started doing Olympic weightlifting. That was not odd or you know awkward for me. I was very comfortable with that position mm -hmm. overhead because it was something I've done before. It's like staying on high bar, going through vertical, going through a handstand, or being on rings right. in a handstand or parallel bars. It has a very similar feel to things that gymnasts are used to because we go through all those different planes. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was going to say that I've never, on the other side, I've never seen you hold a barbell overhead with a straight wrist. It's always back. You have your hand wrapped around the bar. Mm -hmm. um, but that comparison that you just made makes sense. Why? And you're also spending a significant amount of time uh, in a in a handstand, which is wrist back uh, right, all the way right. as well. Even though your hand is open, you're used to supporting load in that wrist back position. And but and we also do it on parallettes and on single sure. rails, and it will mimic a lot of what you'd be doing with overhead position as well. So I, I find that to be actually one of the more comfortable positions that I have in the Olympic weightlifting world. So overhead position, overhead squats, those are things that I actually feel pretty comfortable with. Yep. Uh, so I guess for me, I need to start comparing my. Um, turnover wrist position to the pull of my lift because yeah. my wrist is is hanging and straight uh, in that position and, and maybe that can help me maybe there's hope for me after all with with bar muscle ups well I'm, I'm curious uh, uh, you know how's your false grip uh it's it's not uh, sustainable a whole mm -hmm. lot it, i mean it, it's okay i i'm strong in 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 most everything for brief amounts of time you know, I right, can do right. one muscle up very good. Um, I just can just dies out on you really quickly. Just, yeah, just there, there's no, I'll use the word capacity again. Yeah. There's, there's no capacity there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that would make sense, right? You're so used in that, that drop wrist position or that wrist being back. Uh, that's something like a false grip is new for you. But that might be, I'm not saying that you should use a false grip when you're doing the wrist right. turnover for a bar muscle up, but that opposing action can go a long mm -hmm. way in just building range and being being able to understand exactly what the wrist position needs to look like when you're actually applying to something like a bar muscle up. For sure, yeah. I, one of the drills that, that I've done a couple times uh, from you, I believe, is getting on rings, holding a, um, a lacrosse ball or something in your yeah. hand, and then holding on to the... Even, I think I've even done it on, on the bar, yep. the pull-up bar yep. as well. Yeah, you can do it on bar or the rings. Uh, so that's that kind of thing is what you're talking about in strengthening that opposite um, position. That's exactly right. Yep. Cool. Now, I, I wonder, uh, as I was thinking about the recording that we're going to do here and some of the things that I've seen done and some of the things that I've done as a coach myself when when trying to teach gymnastics, what do you think about um, jumping bar muscle-ups? Do you think there are any value there? Uh, yes. I think it's really important to kind of look at certain movements and you know, most of the time things are not just black and white, right? There's nuance to a lot of things and you have to say, okay, well, what is the purpose of this movement? Now, I think that jumping bar muscle ups can have a lot of value in building movement pattern for people to understand exactly what's happening from the bottom of the swing through to the top of the, the push. And so I think it can have value in terms of building the mechanics of what the entire movement can look look like for someone that doesn't know and has never done it before. Similar to how a spot, someone getting hands-on with you, can help guide you through the mechanics of that full movement. Now, along with that, those are the benefits of uh, something like a, um, a jumping bar muscle-up. Um, I don't like the bar muscle-up, uh, the jumping bar muscle-up for a few reasons. One, most of the time you're standing on a box. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it shortens your ability to create the hollow in the arch, your two end ranges. So when you're doing the front part of the swing, you end up getting into an arch position that reinforces the hips and knees leading forward. Because you're in such a compact range, mm -hmm. you end up reinforcing an arch that doesn't reset the arch through yeah. the upper back and shoulders, which is what we were talking about from before as being such a critical component. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly doing this jumping bar muscle up off of a box, you're leading with the knees and with the hips through the front part of the arch, which is reinforcing a bad position. Mm -hmm. So the front part of the swing is not being uh, touched on enough. It gets neglected and you end up going through poor positions. So when you start going for a bar muscle without the box, your you know mindset is I need to get my knees and hips forward instead of re reinforcing and engaging through the, the, the torso and the shoulders. So that can be a big limiting factor in terms of its application for a, uh, a bar muscle up when you start to take the box away. So for me, there, there's a plus and a minus to it. I think mm -hmm. if you are going to be using a box, I would want it to be as close to your full hang as possible. So you're only using the box as needed mm -hmm. and trying as best you can to reinforce the shoulders coming through on each of the arch positions. So that can be a reinforced position as well. Not just worrying about what happens behind the bar, but also worrying about what happens in front of the bar. For sure. So... With someone, say, that's in a CrossFit class and there's bar muscle-ups in the workout and, and obviously they're going to be 
getting tired and fatiguing and they're not uh, they don't have bar muscle ups yet but they're they're pretty close to it what would your go-to modification besides um, jumping bar muscle up be well i would say it would be any of the the kipping pull actions that they're capable of doing um, like we said from earlier, you know, a, a kipping pull up, kipping chest to bar and a bar muscle up are all the same movement along one mm-hmm. single continuum. So my goal for them would be to pull as high as they possibly can and use that as a standard for that workout and say, okay, this is going to be extremely challenging for you because you're pulling to your peak point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll be able to keep the same stimulus in place that's intended for that workout. You might be lacking some of the push workouts. So what we would end up doing is maybe add some bar dips as a secondary component. So we want the push and the pull to both be affected. So I would normally have people do things like, you know, uh, cut the number down of the pull, but doing peak pull. And then I would do a single rail rail, um, push type of an action, uh, which would mimic a bar in hand as opposed Mm -hmm. to them being parallel to each other. So instead of being on something like parallettes, uh, I would align two parallettes in one straight line Okay. And do push-ups on one straight line, which would mimic a little bit more of the hand pattern and the pushing that they would be equating to if they were above the bar. Gotcha. So yeah, uh, next time I will I will modify not with a jumping bar muscle up, but with uh, uh, with just some uh, kipping chest of bars and some um, bar push-ups. I like it. Yeah, I, th- I think both of them have value, though. You know, like I said, yeah. the 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 pattern that's built and the mechanics that are built with the jumping can be a good thing. And the other thing I'll say with uh, scaling options in general that there's not going to be just one scaling option that's yeah. always appropriate for that person. And you don't always revert back to the same scaling option. I think mixing in different scaling options for a particular movement allow you to tackle it from different ways and also give you a better perspective as to where your strengths and weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. So if you're always doing the same scaling option, you're getting good at that scale. You're not really yeah. maybe tackling it from a different perspective. So I really like the idea of saying, okay, you know, if I'm going to be doing this scale this week, I'm going to vary it up next time I attack it to kind of just get it from a different angle. Yeah, I think what I really got out of what you were saying about the jumping bar muscle-ups, Dave, was probably more people than not that are doing those aren't really ready to do those either because they need to be able to come from a lower box. So if you have to use a box that's that's really high, that's say you're standing on that box and the, the pull-up bar is touching your forehead – then that's probably a yeah. little bit too high and you should do uh, another modification. Yeah, so you're exactly right. Uh, if the box needs to be that high, it can create more of a detriment in the front part of the swing, but it can help the back part of the swing or the back part of the pull. So if it's being, you know, if you're targeting and just saying we're going to work on the timing of the pull and we're going to work on the back mm-hmm. part of the swing behind the bar, what happens in that hollow and in the initiation of the pull, mm-hmm. and you're just focusing there, then the jumping pull up, Jumping uh, bar muscle up can be a good tool with that higher box, but in terms of the completion of the movement, there's going to be some negative effects on the front part of that swing. Cool. Uh, so I think I have maybe just uh, one or two more questions. Again, just things that I hear and that I've said as a coach as well. Um, what do you think about uh, uh, the cue of hips to bar or even knees to bar uh, as the last part of that? kick to try to get over uh so that cue happens very often on rings and bar work as well if you're hearing hips to bar or knees to bar you know that some part of the body's being neglected mm-hmm. you know what i mean some part of your lower half is not being involved in the movement and i'm not saying that the the knees and the hips are not involved with the movement they absolutely are but if you're telling the person to cue them to their knees or to their hips to the bar you're essentially telling them to forget about what happens with the rest of their body. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's more important to help to build this connection of what's happening through the entire body. So I do want people to understand that, yes, hips are part of the movement. Yes, the knees are going to be part of the movement, but we want the entire body to be part of the movement, not just, you know, uh, thinking about segments or just the hips and then the legs become dead weight. So I think it can sometimes be... um, uh, a, a detriment to the eventual movement if you're focusing completely on trying to get the hips to the bar or the knees to the bar because the the rest of the body that's not being uh, thought of or not being kind of cued in becomes something that just pulls you down. It becomes that dead weight. Yeah, it's uh, uh would I, I mean it sounds to me like it's a, a band aid. Mm-hmm. It, and it uh, what it also is it's 
it's a cue for someone who's impatient. Yeah. Because you haven't completed the swing. Yeah. So if you're telling someone to pull the hips to the bar, you haven't allowed them to fully initiate the entire swing. Yeah. So they, it, it's a cue for impatience, essentially. So um, we want to try to stay away from those types of cues. So that's probably why knees to bar works for me sometimes, Dave, because I'm impatient in my in my swing. So knees to bar, that's a, a separate conversation. Knees to bar can actually help in some cases, but I would never want someone to start with that. Right. And I, I would want people to understand the, the reason behind knees to bar being a benefit, but only after they understand how to use the entire body, meaning toes coming up and rising as opposed to knees. And the reason why knees can pretend, this is just a little off on a tangent, but I want to make sure that people understand this. Um, going from a long lever to a short lever can speed up a movement, right? Anything mm -hmm. that goes from long to short will speed that action up. Right. So if you're going from a really long lever where the legs are really fully extended and then you time it correctly and bring the knees in to basically a tuck position, mm -hmm. it can speed up the turnover. So there is benefit of leading mm -hmm. through the knee if you know how to time it correctly. But this is not something I would teach to someone right off the bat. Sure. It's something that a really high level athlete will know how to apply mm -hmm. because they know the difference between a long lever and a short lever and how to apply those so that they can speed up at a particular moment's notice. So it's, it's a really nuanced approach to it. It would not be something that I would teach someone right off the bat. But it's important to note that knees coming up to the bar can potentially speed up the action if they go from long lever to short lever. I like it, and I would say that that Dave, my timing is not right to be using. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you would not be one of those people using no, that, that portion it, of the movement. Yeah, exactly. I just need to I just need to break it down, and like um, many, I'm sure many of the listeners out there uh, need to break it down and and understand where you're at and uh, take the the appropriate steps to 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 build from there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, Dave, that was a, a a great conversation there for me. I learned a lot as an athlete and a coach there that I'm going to be able to apply as many times as I've already heard you talk about uh, <laughs> gymnastics through the years. Most of that, I will say, has been about the handstand, so I don't get right. to hear you talk about um, bar muscle-ups a, a whole lot, so I definitely learned a lot there. Did you have anything else that, um, you know, while we're on here, you wanted to share with uh, the listeners what's coming up with Power Monkey and that kind of thing? Um, not really. There's going to be a ton of new stuff. I won't, um, I won't break any news right now, but just definitely uh, continue to look on the Power Monkey website, powermonkeyfitness.com, because we have some really cool up and coming things, but uh, we'll be in the process of unveiling them over the course of the next couple of months. Good deal. Well, we won't do our normal uh, gameplay. I'm not going to ask you again if you like gymnastics or weightlifting better or anything like that. But um, uh, because I think I know the answer to that, I think I've talked <laughs> you into uh, into weightlifting, and you won't admit it. But um, do you have any uh, just to kind of uh, you know stay consistent with this portion of the recording? Do you have any any books that you recommend? Uh, that you've been reading here lately. I know you recommended Sapiens to me yeah, not yeah. too long ago. And I'll tell you, that book, I think I'm probably about 40 or 50 pages in, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's deep. It, it, right? It's pretty deep, yeah. It's it's fascinating, yeah. Sapiens is the one that uh, you know has been recommended to me a ton, and I finally went and picked it up, and I've just been like diving through it. And it's been just, it's really incredible to hear kind of the history of uh, homo sapiens and human race and kind of where we've come from over the course of the past 14 billion years up till now. And it's just a really cool book. And, and I highly recommend that. Another one, um, you know, I come from a science background. I studied human biology, uh, in college. And one of my, uh, human biology professors was, uh, Dr. Robert Spolsky, who is, uh, very highly active in the human behavioral science world. And, uh, he came out with a book, um, recently that, I think would be uh, a good book for most people who are interested in kind of uh, how people act and react. It's called Behave. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more heavy duty on the science side. Uh, it's going to be a little bit slower of a book in terms of uh, mm -hmm. getting through it than Sapiens is, but it's another one that's definitely worth picking up, Behave. Behave. I, I got it. So I'll take that as another recommendation from you, Dave, and I'll pick yep. that one up for sure. It sounds very interesting. I'm definitely interested uh, in all that kind of thing. And really, all that stuff ties together with, with what we talk about all the time, you know, human human movement. And a lot of human movement has to do with 
um, our our history and the way that we think and the way that we process and everything else. So, uh, guys, we, we certainly hope you enjoyed the recording once again. And be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for services and upcoming events. Uh, check out our Instagram pages as well for regular teaching and technical content at uh, PowerMonkeyFitness, also at Dave Durante and at Ollie Chad. We'd love to hear from you as well. You guys can always leave us a rating or a, re- or a review wherever you're getting your podcast. And by the way, I will say I had, I've had a couple questions about if we're going to be on Google Play, and um, uh, we will be getting that taken care of here pretty soon. So any of you that would rather listen on there, that'll be available for you. But um, uh, contact us with any questions or requests as well by leaving us a message at uh, podcast at powermonkeyfitness.com. And on behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Bond with Dave Durani, and until next time, thank you all for listening.